Tēnā koutou katoa, uh, ko Graham Ingalls, Taku um, I'm going to preface this talk by saying that this is a, a desktop study, so you won't be seeing any beautiful coloured slides of fish swimming through kelp. But there is one particularly colourful slide that uh, I want to credit my colleagues Kelly May and Kelly Ratana for, for putting together. What I'm going to be talking about in this talk is really three strands of work that we've been doing as a desktop study. One is looking at how practice and risk assessment is changing to deal with complex environmental problems and the kinds of context and decision structures that you need to put in place to deal with that. The other two components that, that are running in parallel streams are really looking at how Mataranga can play a larger role in the assessment of decisions that involve risk where there are complex consequences. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as I go through. But the other strand is really looking at new tools that, that are being developed or have been developed that actually can be used to support greater participation in decisions about complex, um, multifaceted risks. Given that this is a risk and uncertainty session, it's probably worth having a definition or two. Um, this is the classic definition of risk, where you're dealing with a hazard or an event of some sort that is likely to have consequences for one or more assets or people. And what you're trying to do is actually estimate the likelihood of that outcome and to develop strategies to manage around it. The conventional approach to risk assessment is kind of captured in this um, uh, US EPA guideline from the 1990s. And that essentially, if you look very closely, you can see that what it says is you get together a risk manager and a technical person and they develop the problem. They go away, work out what the, what the hazard is, try and work out what the level of exposure to some valued asset is, develop a model and characterise that risk and then communicate those results back to the manager and he makes some decisions. It's a very, um, it's a technical idea of how risk analysis is done. But we've known for a long time that that doesn't work for most problems about risk. I and mean, this is from a US National Research Council document that's nearly 40 years old now, which basically says that, that science and professional analysis alone can't solve disputes about risk and that such models should be rejected. And the reason for that is that many of the complex problems that we have are not dealing with just a single consequence and therefore effects on a single outcome or an asset, but multiple consequences that we then have to trade off against. It often involves a range of different stakeholders and the different value sets that they bring to that decision framework, which means that there's a diversity of opinions. The other thing is that people generally, although we can estimate probabilities or likelihoods of events, people generally deal pretty poorly with those. And so if you talk to someone and say, well, actually there's a very, very low probability of an oil spill, but if it does happen, it's going to cause really bad effects, people don't kind of take that on very well. So what we're needing is a better approach to risk assessment that deals with uncertainty and that deals with the complexity of those situations. And what, so what risk assessment is moving to is a, a system like this, which is actually from the NASA's risk assessment process. And that's to a more deliberative process where there's a greater range of people involved in actually setting the framework for the risk analysis deciding on a set of performance measures for how that system should perform and then putting in place measures to actually track that through time. So it acknowledges that, that science and technical input plays a role in risk assessment, um, but so do other factors as well. So the, the decision context, and again this is from the NASA document, really involves a collaborative setting of decision alternatives, so not just a single path or a single model for risk, but identifying the different decision alternatives and the management objectives that are trying to be met, a technical analysis that forms the basis for discussions about risk, and then a deliberative setting that allows you to sort through and, and choose from 
the options, the decision options that achieve an overall outcome. And then the other part of this is that that's, that decision doesn't stop there. It feeds into a continuous process where you're evaluating the performance of that decision and adjusting it through time. And those of you who've, who have read the literature on decision um, management will know that this fits into what's called a structured decision framework, where there's a deliberative or collaborative setting of, of principles. That's the approach that we've taken to look at the, the involvement of mataranga. And I guess one of the things about conventional risk assessments is that often they've focused on quantitative technical estimation and it's been very difficult to build in more qualitative uh, value sets and value sets that, that are unfamiliar to Western scientists. What we've been doing is, is very similar to the two waka model, is actually to look at how mataranga and tikanga can be built into a risk assessment framework in an equal footing with the scientific information that goes in. So this is work that Kelly May and Kelly Ratana have been doing, which uses a, a structured decision-making framework and goes through the various stages that are involved in developing a risk decision and the kinds of, of input that come in from a Western science point of view and from a, a cultural and, and mataranga point of view. The other element that we've been looking at are tools that can be used to apply to these complex decision frameworks. And this is what I'm going to spend the, the rest of the talk talking about. So the list of, of options there are things that have been developed quite recently to develop, deal with these complex risk problems. And they've been enabled largely through the development of increased computing power and, and also better data analytics, because they do rely on essentially computer experiments of future scenarios. So if you, if you come from an empirical background like me, you like to think that you can build a model to predict risk, and that while there's uncertainty in that model, you can work to reduce that uncertainty. What that doesn't take account of is the range of different outcomes that, that could potentially eventuate from that decision framework on a range of different um, environmental components. What each of these tools does is flip that, flip that approach on its head and basically say, what's the range of possible scenarios that could eventuate in the future? And how does my decision outcome stack against that in terms of its robustness or its likelihood to succeed? So there's a range of different types of methods, but basically some of the common threads that they have is that they're not seeking an optimal, uh, an optimal solution. What they're seeking is a solution that's robust across a wide range of possible future scenarios. And so the way that they do that is to actually generate those scenarios across the, the uncertain factors that are included within that decision space and future state. And I'll give you a little example about that as we go through. They basically use computational tools to do thought experiments about a range of possible future states and then use um, data mining tools, things like boosted regression trees and random forests, to sort through those possible um, future states to identify the, the types of uncertainty that are most critical in determining the success or failure of a particular policy decision. The other thing that they do is that many of these processes have been accompanied by a range of visualisation tools that actually allow a, a group of people to decide on the decision framework to start with, to actually develop the types of functional res of relationships between the, the kinds of variables that you're interested in and the performance of that system, and then to analyse the strategies that are uh, able to go forward. So this is one of the types of tools. This is a thing called robust decision making. Um, most of these tools have been used in the context of climate change and water resource management. The idea is that there's four steps. So a participatory scoping stage, where essentially what you're trying to do is identify the system, define its uncertainties, the, the levers or the policy levers, the decisions that are possible, 
um, to actually make the changes. The relationships in this one here between the policy levers and some measures of performance that you want to see in the system. And then basically you sample across that uncertainty to generate a range of a multi multitude of scenarios which you can then use to test your um, preferred baseline strategy, your decision strategy against to see how robust it is. You then use those data analytics to sort through those strategies to see which conditions most affect the failure of your decision or your policy strategy and use that to feed into how you might then hedge or change that strategy to actually make it more robust to those critical uncertainties. So here's, here's an example of an application of, of this robust decision making technique to flood mitigation and f future flood mitigation in, in Vietnam. So basically what it shows is that there's six key elements that contribute uncertainty to the situation in the future. The rainfall intensity, the height of the river that might cause flooding, the size of the population in the future, its distribution, the poverty rate and therefore who's most vulnerable, and the level of vulnerability of housing. And you could choose points along any of these to choose a single strategy to model. Or you could sample from throughout all of that space of uncertainty and come up with a range of plausible futures. And that's essentially what they've done in this. So instead of having one strategy that they're analysing, they've generated a thousand strategies from that space of those uncertain factors. And what they then do is sort through and look at how robust their preferred strategy is to those future states. So here they're using a performance measure of basically what they said at the start was that they didn't want risk to be elevated for poor and non-poor alike. So basically everyone is affected equitably. And what you can see from this graph is that in the future strategies using their their preferred mitigation options, only about 4% of future scenarios um, will that happen. And so what they've got to do is look at the changes in that strategy and how they manage those changes to actually achieve, uh, to cope with these future situations. So this is the baseline situation of the existing infrastructure. And these are various predictions of changes in rainfall intensity and flood height um, based on climate change scenarios. So what it tells you is that that baseline strategy is nowhere near going to achieve um, protection for both the, the poor and the non-poor. You can also use this approach to then overlay within that framework different types of mitigation strategies um, and determine their robustness and cycle through that again. and also look at the different costs. So you can build in different metrics of performance to analyse in that state space. OK, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to skip over this one, but we can get back to this later on. This is another type of technique. Basically, the, these are all quite new tools. They're all being tested out. And what we're seeing now is a range of, of studies where these different approaches are actually being applied together to the same problem to look at how they perform. The other thing that's happening is also that there's a range of open source software tools that allow these different stages of the scenario generation and scenario analysis to, to be done. And they're available both in, um, in R and in Python. I think overall, in terms of some of the work that we've done so far in the review, there's a few things that come out of it. These tools are based on plausible scenarios rather than probable scenarios, or the most probable scenarios, which means that you can look across a range of, of possible futures and incorporate, it, it will then allow you to incorporate things like surprises and potential threshold transitions that you might not otherwise incorporate in a more deterministic model. The, the, the way that they're put together with the visualisations means that they do facilitate participatory design and evaluation of risk um, considerations. 
you can incorporate both qualitative and quantitative models to, to assist in that process. But one of the key challenges is that they are, because they flip that whole um, decision-making framework on its head, they do require some expert facilitation to walk people through the process and to design the context of the situation. And they're also computationally quite intensive. <laughs>